Hey, greetings. Thanks for joining me. It's Fred in Alaska. Um, conference is coming up a little over a week. Fairbanks, Carlson Center. Um, Boreal is Bigfoot.com. I believe you can get tickets or at, at the Carlson Center. What I wanted to share with you today, and, and thanks for all the new subscribers joining us here. Um, uh, this guy, uh, his name is uh, Michael Hollister. He used to live in Alaska up until uh, roughly a decade ago and this experience isn't why he left Alaska but it was his last hunting experience so he loved to hunt black bear um, he liked to get himself what you know a berry bear you know bears that have been on a berry patch for a week you know and so it was it's his thing I'm, I'm not a big fan of bear meat you know any scavenger really but to each his own no, no judgment there well he was doing a, a DIY do-it-yourself bear hunt uh, across Kachemak Bay in the Kenai Mountains so this this incident happened about 15 years ago roughly um, Michael is in his 70s now and he's wanting to get certain things in his life off his chest and whatnot um, and he reached out a while back and we had some hard time getting coordinated on getting uh, a telephonic interview. Um, he had had a, a stroke about five years ago, so he wanted to do an interview and we attempted a couple times, but uh, his speech was just, it wasn't conducive to a, a, a very good interview. Um, I appreciate his efforts and so <laughs> we'll, we'll handle it this way. Uh, so understand where this guy went black bear hunting and it was unaware to him for many many years uh it just hairy man bigfoot wasn't in his wheelhouse up until these days so this area is would be northeast of portlock not very far um you know and i i would be willing to bet that uh, a couple of these creatures in this incident were probably from the same same area you know where the historical thing in Portlock happened so what makes this different is it, it's not just your run-of-the-mill hairy man scream person leaves uh, so let, let's let's just get into it let me explain to you what was going on so he was in day three of his hunt he had seen a couple black bears, uh, none that he felt were worthy of, of taking. So he, he held his shots and just decided he's going to wait for the one. You know, he wanted to get the good one. So he's on basically an alpine slope going along the berry patches, trying to pick out a black bear at a distance and then spot and stalk, do his thing. So he's on this particular ridge, and uh, this would be somewhere outside of, Port Graham I'm sure and he's he's going along and you know he hears float plane off in the distance which is not uncommon you know especially in Alaska so he's just listening to the hum of the plane and as he's he's glassing he's looking for this bear and uh, he decides well I'm gonna I'm gonna go over this next little ridge and I'm gonna sit in this little saddle that he knew of in between these two little ridges is little elevated saddle kind of like a plateau but it's got a dip in it and he's just gonna nestle down there and potentially camp there and catch something first thing in the morning just below him down in this meadow where all these berries were so he starts working his way up there and it's it's getting on into dusk and so he knows he needs to get to it now he's not totally above tree line he's just almost at tree line uh, elevation wise so as he's going along he's he's getting a little winded and he decides well I'm gonna take a break right here for a minute I got time to get to where I know I'm going and be good to go he wasn't planning any fire or anything like that so all he had to do is roll out his sleeping bag do his thing uh, so he gets up sits down in this area where he got up to not not literally stood up or anything he he gets to this area where he's going to take his break and it, he's sitting on this mound of tundra and uh, i can imagine something like right next to me or whatever but so he sits down and he's sitting there and 
it's before dusk, but it's it's getting dark. Everything is silhouetted. And he has approximately, uh, he guesstimated about 80 yards till the tree line break. And then it's just all, it's almost fjord like. You got to understand the terrain. If you look at the Kenai Mountains, you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, there's some little valleys in there and stuff. But once you get to the base of the mountain, it, you know, they're, they're fjord like. They just jettison straight up. Not, not literally, but, you know, anyway. So he's sitting there and he's trying to figure out what that sound is. He's hearing the sound and it's uh, the direction he's facing is, I guess it would be due east. He's facing due east where he was sitting and it would be off to his left hand side. He's hearing movement in the trees between him and that the end of the tree line on the alpine level. And so he's really curious about this noise. He's thinking, oh, I wonder if the black bear was above me. And maybe stalking me as I was trying to stalk it. So he thought it was kind of comical that, oh, geez, this is going to be a story to tell people where I'm stalking a bear, but yet the bear ends up stalking me kind of thing, right? So he's just kind of chuckles to himself about the potential situation he's in. Now, as Michael's sitting there, he decides he's going to eat one of his granola bars. And he's doing it intentionally, hoping that the wrapper sound and the smell will entice this bear to show itself. Uh, seven millimeter mag rifle. Uh, he wasn't worried about needing anything else. <laughs> he gets halfway done with his granola bar and he's trying to ignore the noises off to his left hand side. He's got the rifle right where he can easily grab it. He's in a spot where he has time to react and he's confident in what he's doing. Very, very confident. Now, <laughs> this noise sounds like it's coming closer and closer and then he realizes it's it's more like a pacing and he starts thinking he's like hmm, I never known a bear to pace like that they'll usually circle around wind you or something try to get eyes on you see if you're a potential prey or not so he decides well I'm going to go straight at this bear flush it out I, the, if it breaks the tree line it's gonna be down in open meadow I can at least get a shot on it maybe so he rethinks it because of it getting dark and he doesn't want to deal with shooting in that kind of light so he reevaluates on the fly and goes i'm gonna stop trying to flush this i'm gonna go back down and i'm gonna continue to my camp he, he totally rethinks it as he was moving so he gets up to go and then changes his mind after a couple steps rethinks it thinks better of it grabs his pack slings it takes his rifle and he starts going to where he knows he's going to camp <laughs> he gets about from what he said about eight steps into this journey to where he's uh, he guesstimated he was within a quarter to half mile of where this little bench saddled spot is that he was going to be camping out on so he determines uh you know i, I can get there in probably 20 30 minutes so i'm gonna pace myself because he, he just started and he felt himself trying to rush so he wanted to calm down lower his energy level a little bit and and, and gain focus uh he said what was weird is that eight steps in or whatever he felt overwhelmingly uh watched he felt like he was being watched so he was taking it as bears got eyes on me let me you know let me let me calm down so if something happens i'm not all worked up but as he's going along he's getting more and more anxious right the movement's continuing uh it, the pacing had stopped after he stood up and started moving and then it's it's basically pacing him but off behind him just a little ways off on his left always out of view but back behind him so he's he's really nervous about having something quasi behind him behind his direction so he's he's slowing down in hopes that it catches up to him parallels him so that way he can at least not have to worry about looking directly behind him or have something behind him right so as he's going along this movement continues and it does it, it does catch up when he slows down but it parallels him there's there's no other bear-like behavior to this right so he's really thrown off at what's going on it's getting darker and he he finds himself checking to make sure he's got a round in the chamber even though he's a disciplined hunter he doesn't like making click noises out in the field he knows there's a round in that chamber he said he was feeling so uneasy uh, his skin was crawling and he had never out of all the years which are very many bear hunting brown black whatever he 
never felt this way. So he, he felt out of place. He felt like he didn't belong there and he felt very nervous about the situation he was in. He continues on, he reaches this thicker wooded area and it's just darkness with the light skyline, you know, going into dusk. And so he decides, man, I don't want to be going through these dark trees, even though they're small, they're not very big, they're a little thick here, a little sparser over here. You know, he's trying to evaluate the best plan of action. So he says, you know what, I'm going to, instead of camping up on that saddle where I wanted to, I'm going to go straight down, cross this this upper alpine meadow of these berry patches and, and camp down a tree line down further down. So he makes up his mind and he starts creating distance between him and this noise. Now, as, as he's creating this distance, he's in the open now. And he's hearing movement up behind him. It's getting in the dark because he's moving slow. He's very methodical. He's, uh, he said in his 2020 hindsight, he thought maybe subconsciously he was trying to draw whatever it was out. Well, he gets about half the distance to where he wants to set up camp instead. And he said it was approximately 300 yards that he has moved away from where he was eating a snack. Uh, there were some broken trees, uh, not broken, but uh, broken up areas of trees. There's a small little patch here, a small little patch over there. So it was kind of sparse once he cleared the area, right? Coming down into the alpine meadow. He gets out into this open area and immediately he's he's shaking. Uh, he wasn't cold. He, he felt overwhelmingly nervous. So he decides he's going to take a knee and look up and see why what's what's causing this so he does so he takes a knee and he looks back up and he said he saw dark movement and it, it was it, it was hard to make out but whatever it was was a lot bigger than any black bear he ever had seen but it was still pitch black so he figures okay it's the silhouette of a brown bear it's just in in the shade you know, it, it's in the dark trees. So I, obviously I'm not gonna, I, I'm not after a brown bear. So he decides thinking about a brown bear, he's just gonna continue further on down, not camp where he was gonna the second time, but then pick a different spot further down in the valley. So he, he's debating himself every movement now. Should I just continue going straight? Should I break my, my line of walking? Should I zig left and then zig back right? and see if I could draw this thing out. He wanted to, first of all, make sure what he potentially might be shooting at and, and just to find out what he might be shooting at, right? So he, he's got all these things. He's debating himself in his mind. So he decides, I'm going to zigzag. So he starts zigzagging a little bit, slow down, speed up, trying to be sporadic, trying to, trying to invoke some kind of reaction from whatever it is up the hill from him. <laughs> As he's doing so, he notices a weird sound. So... He, he's trying to place what what is this weird it, it was like a a weird kind of hum a weird kind of motor noise but it, it was almost muffled it was almost distorted in a weird way and he couldn't figure it out so he's looking around looking around and as he's panning to the left of where he last saw this dark figure he notices a black helicopter above the tree line and he's astonished he's totally blown away this this helicopter should be making a lot more noise at that distance he it should be damn near deafening how close it was but it wasn't it was just a weird noise he couldn't make out this this helicopter had no lights on whatsoever none no flashing strobes no no safety strobes or none of that it was totally blacked out he could just see it above the trees and it was a perfect silhouette of that helicopter uh he didn't know the exact make of the helicopter he just said military like so that really threw him off and he's like what i'm not breaking any laws i have my i have my permit i have my tag i i'm totally legit so he decides whatever's going on i'm just gonna continue minding my business because i have n nothing to do with those guys he goes on he ends up things quiet down and stuff once he gets further down into this valley and he finds a little little outcropping of trees and decides that that's the spot i'm gonna camp well he gets over to it, and he's still watching way up the ridge now because he, he created quite a distance, uh, damn near a mile, and it was well on to getting dark. Well, 
he heard that, that weird sound fade away. No sooner than the weird sound faded away, he heard a large crashing boom bang sound up the slope where he had last saw what he thought was a brown bear silhouetted in the darkness. He did not like the feeling he got when he heard those noises, the, the, the crashing and the breaking. Um, Michael said that he wished there was more daylight. He would have just hiked out right then. He, he felt overwhelmingly compelled to get out of there. So he decides, uh, he already knew within himself he wasn't going to be able to fall asleep. So what he does is he decides he's going to uh, play a counting game and some other mind games just to keep himself from, you know, slowly dozing off from being tired. At this point, he's an older guy. He's been hiking. Yeah, he's been at this for a couple days already, and he's just, you know, it wears on somebody, even someone young and fit. You know, you get them out hiking up and down the mountains a few times over the course of a couple days, it's going to wear your ass out. I don't care who you are. So he decides, I'm just going to do these things. I'm going to have an open line of sight. You know, he had flashlights, he had plenty of batteries, but he preferred not to use them unless he had to. So as he's as he's debating on flashlighting a sound he's been hearing that sounds like it's getting closer and closer <laughs> he's like do i man i'm let me let me hold off before i flash this thing with the flashlight ruin my night vision temporarily and see if it comes closer if it comes closer i'm gonna beam it and potentially have to shoot this bear if, if it's showing any sign of aggression or not going away i'm, I'm just gonna end this crap and, and shoot this bear so the noise continues his, he said his level of uh, unwarranted fear was just rising by the minute. He felt like he was, uh, like there was this overwhelming fear pressure on him. And it, it just seemed so weird because he had never felt that before. He had been in tense situations with brown bears, black bears, and whatnot. And he, he just, he couldn't understand and wrap his mind around why he was feeling this way. So he decides, all right, he takes the safety off his rifle and he's kind of got it cop style, you know, he's got the flashlight and resting the, the stock of the gun over his wrist, you know. And he didn't like doing that. He didn't have a better way at the moment. He just thought, I'm going to beam the whatever it is going to see the light and get the hell out of Dodge. It'll realize I'm human and not prey. <laughs> this particular flashlight he had was a, uh, a surefire weapon style light. Uh, 900 lumen uh, pretty bright but the batteries didn't last too long so what he does is he lights up the area in which he sees this or hears this noise and he gets eye shine back but the eye shine he gets back is further away than he thought it was and he thought it was two animals uh, because of how quickly he hit the light the he thought the eye shine that the the, the the distance between the eye shine was too far to be just one animal. He thought maybe two, one looking out from one shrub, one looking out from another shrub, and that's why he was seeing the two eye shine. He, he was trying to wrap his mind around that big of eye shine that far apart. You know, there, there, it's just, it shouldn't be. He kills the light and he starts contemplating. He's like, okay, there's two things. So in his mind, he's thinking there's two things at this moment. So he goes, okay, let me let let me let them come in closer. Let's see if they leave or if they come in closer after shining the light on them. He sits there, he said, uncomfortably for about an hour until he hears movement again. And so he, he stays calm, he stays disciplined, and he waits till this noise is what he's assuming is in a clearing between where he had seen the eye shine versus where he's at. So as soon as he feels confident that this noise is indeed had split the difference, he beams again he understands why it was such a wide eye shine uh, it was one creature it was a hairy man and it was pitch black it had that time of year they're like mosquitoes anyway so pitch black uh, he said it had a very weird kind of milky gray kind of complexion to it he said he he panicked uh he he looked at it for a brief moment he saw the eye shine he saw this thing look like it was quasi squatted down 
which was still really big at the distance, right? So immediately he's like, what the hell? And he shoots a round off, not, not directly at it, but just pops a round off to, to try to scare this thing off. Well, it, it worked. The thing, it, it took off. It took off to his left, and he heard it for quite a while. So a little while after this happens, he's panic-stricken. He doesn't know what he saw. He doesn't know what the hell he's going to do. And so he decides, I'm not sitting right here. I'm going to move further down uh, to where this river was and, and, and be over there by the river. If I, if I got to escape, I'll jump into the river, do whatever I got to do. I don't know what the hell that thing is, right? Because, again, he had no reference points. He had never heard of the port lock mysteries and all that kind of shit. <clears throat> which is it's whatever a lot of people haven't so he's sitting there and he's as he's going along he's he's con he's replaying what has happened and, and trust me it, he's moving along he's not just do to do it's not a walk in the park um i asked him i was like when you saw it with the flashlight what were your feelings when you saw it what he said it was in a position of like a linebacker on the line of scrimmage getting ready to rush a passer fair enough you know and I asked him uh when you saw it what exactly did you see and again he just explained the 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 skin on the face looked like a, a milky off gray and uh he said almost like a almost like a birch color and the eyes were eye shine of course and the hair looked to be pitch black but it looked almost mangy like uh his light was bright enough to break through the the coarseness of the hair and see the skin underneath he said it wasn't mangy, but it, it wasn't a bear, it wasn't a man, and, and it took off running, right, after he popped the shot. So he gets down closer to this river, and as he's sitting there, he's he's borderline terrified. He heard it run off, but again, he doesn't know what it is at this point. He's freaking out, and so he decides, all right, I'm just going to hunker down. He got himself into a cluster of trees to where... Uh, something that big would make a lot of noise coming up behind him and so he had an open line of fire in front of him to back into a corner basically right he didn't like the feeling but that's what he felt he could do in the moment um and he he admitted himself the the black spruce and shit behind him were not much of a you know protection but it was better than just open air he puts another round into his rifle as he's sitting here, and and he's really worried about what's going to come of this situation. Next day comes, he kind of dozed off a little bit just before sunrise. There was no other noises or anything. And as he's waking up, he, he feels an overwhelming sense of peace, like, wow, that was weird what I dealt with, but I think I'm okay. I think I'm okay. And as he's sitting there, you know, he's kind of rubbing his eyes. He's eating another granola bar, and he notices a very nice black bear off in the distance eating berries. And he's like, perfect, perfect. I'm, that's a good-sized boar. It's eating berries. Perfect criteria. That's what I want. I'm going to stalk this bear. So he puts the, the night before out of his mind as much as he could. He said he kept always looking around, uh, almost to the point of it, it was ruining his hunt. Uh, again, he had no reference. He was still quasi in shock. His words, not mine. He, he said, if I had been in my right mind, I'd have already been booking it out of there. I saw that bear. I, nothing really happened with that, whatever it was, his words, not mine. Whatever that was that came in on me. I'm just, I'm going to do my thing. I got plenty of daylight now. I can get my bear that I want and I can get back to the coast and, and, and get back across towards Homer. So he makes up his mind, a uh, resilient guy, uh, you know, set in his ways. So he starts stalking the bear, and he's at a disadvantage. It's up above him. Uh, the wind ain't the best. It's kind of, uh, like, variable. You know, sometimes it's blowing in his face. Sometimes he feels it blowing past him. He hadn't been winded, so he's just slowly, methodically making his way. And that this is an open terrain now. So he's very slow at doing what he's doing. <clears throat> he gets to within 350 yards of this bear and as he's doing so uh he makes his shot kill shot drops it right after he does the kill shot though uh he hears uh he said it's within moments he he shot the bear it tumbled down 
it was a good shot. It was it, it riled around a little bit and just death throws. It was done. So he stands up. He feels accomplished. He's like, yes, you know, I got I came for what I wanted. It looks like a nice rug on it. I got plenty of meat. You know, uh, he wasn't necessarily there as a trophy hunter. He was there to get himself what he liked, which was that type of bear meat. So he starts slowly making his way up to it just to make sure it's not going to play possum going to jump up and rush him or anything like that he you know of course he's been around and after he closed about half the distance he starts hearing this weird noise uh it, it was the same noise he had heard the the night before when he saw that blacked out helicopter he looks again he's looking around for this noise and he's not seeing where it's coming from so he's really thrown off and he's like i i just need to get my bear meat and get the hell out of here right so he goes and he guts the bear, and as he's as he's doing so, he said he was so nervous he couldn't stay focused on the job at hand. Right? He could not stay. He couldn't stay focused on what he was doing. And so, as he was sitting there, he got it gutted and he started partially uh, taking the hide off so he could bag the quarters into these game bags. You know. He's got his pack board. He guesstimated the bear was probably 275 pounds, un not dressed out. So once it was dressed out, he guesstimated, you know, 150, 170 pounds roughly. And so he's slowly getting this meat packed onto his pack board pack, right? And he's readjusting things and he's getting things right, you know, so when he loads up, he can manage and, and make his way out. As he's doing so, uh, he kept getting interrupted by this strange thought of run, right? He just kept getting this thought, run, you got to run now. And so it, it, it's startling him. It's not making him feel good. Uh, he doesn't know why he's feeling that way uh, outside of the night before thing, but he never felt like he had to just up and run, you know, not especially with nothing around in the middle of the day. So he tries to calm himself down. Uh, he decides I'm going to take a break from what I'm doing and I'm going to make myself some instant coffee and I'm going to, I'm going to sip on some coffee and, and try to figure out what the hell is going on because he, he just felt all this pressure of flee, run, go. So as he's doing so, he, he got a cup of coffee in him and he, it was, it was tasty, even though it was instant, he really wanted some coffee. So he made some more. And as he's in the process of making that second cup, he notices back beyond the gut pile and the black bear uh, at the upper tree line, he sees movement. And he's like, ah, oh, what, what is this? And he takes a look and it's another bear. It was a brown bear and it just kind of was going on about its way, kind of sniffing the air and stuff. And he was like, ah, oh, shit, this bear's gonna wind my kill. It heard the gunshot, it's coming to my gunshot. It, it's winded my kill and it's just tracking down my bear. I'm gonna have to fight this bear off to keep this bear. So he decides, all right, uh, he wasn't quite done with everything he wanted to do, dressing out this bear and getting on the pack board, but he didn't want to fight a bear for his prize. So he decides, all right, let me take what I got. Let me retreat back, make sure this brown bear leaves the area. I don't want to have two bears down, especially for nothing. If the bear comes in, he can have what I didn't get. So he's making this plan the whole time, feeling like I got to go. I, 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 something's not right. Well, he watches the brown bear, it goes off, he had backed away from the kill a little further, and the bear didn't wind him, it didn't appear at all, and it continued down to where he was the night before. A little higher, it was, it was slowly working its way up, and he was just kind of following the, the alpine tree line, the upper tree line, going along, and he just watched it until it was quite a distance away. <laughs> he calms down, and he was just about to go and start finish dressing out this bear. And there wasn't much left to do at that point. He stands up, he grabs his, his knife kit and whatever, he's pureled his hands off again, you know, just keeping the site as clean as possible to keep all the blood he could off of himself. He, he would take one of the game bags and drape it over his leg so he wasn't getting blood all over his pants. And, you know, he'd removed his shirt, uh, the long sleeve one, just so he had a t-shirt on so he could, you know, just, just trying to cover his bases because he was alone. He didn't want to be smelling like fresh blood. <laughs> so he starts this process. As he's doing so, he hears this wallering coming from the direction the bear was at, right? The brown bear. 
Way off in the distance, he sees this brown bear kind of run in a half circle, crash up into the trees running, and then turns, comes halfway down until it's about parallel with him in elevation and turns and beeline straight towards him. Michael said he never was scared of a charging bear ever until this point. And he said the reason he got scared, and this bear was at a distance still, but it, it's not stopped. It, it's, it's seized through, Mike. It's, it's going. It, you know, it's, it's go button was pushed. So he backs out of the way. He said what scared him was the bear looked scared. And he said it was about maybe a 600 pound sow. The bear looked scared. And I was like, well, at that distance, how could you tell? He goes, it, it's, its haunches weren't gristled up. It wasn't in a charging err kind of thing. It was in a get the fuck out of my way kind of mode. He said that he just sensed this bear was fleeing. So he backed away and he figured, okay, once it gets past me, it's gonna smell my kill and then go and get on the gut pile or something, right? He doesn't know what spooked the bear, but he figures that's what's going to go down. He continues to back away, uh, meanwhile dragging his stuff with him, you know, making sure he's trying not to leave anything behind. Uh, he said he left a couple game bags that were draped over him. Uh, he immediately grabbed his hoodie and, you know, his gear and was backing away because this bear was still coming. and. It, it wasn't showing any signs of slowing down. And all this is happening real fast. It's taking me way more longer to explain it to you than how it went down. So he backs away and he gets back towards, uh, he said about half the distance to the lower tree line in this meadow. Damn bugs, I should have put on some mosquito dope. So anyway, uh, he kind of squats down and he's like, ah, bear, don't come towards me. I don't want to have two down bears, you know? I, I don't have a tag for a brownie. This bear, didn't even pay attention to him, just boom, went right on past, didn't give a shit about his kill, didn't care about the fresh blood smell in there, it was gone. His attention was on this brown bear, running, just hauling ass, it was the damnedest thing he ever seen. He's seen bears run, but this, the, how everything was transpiring was just beyond craziness to him, you know, from the night before, the weird helicopter noise, this, you know, just the whole thing. Well, once his attention stops focusing on the bear running away because it was already damn near out of sight. His attention goes back to the direction the bear had run from. Well, about the area he was, he was roughly guesstimating because it was pretty dark once he was retreating from that upper area. He's guesstimating about the same area he was, he saw that thing again. That thing was standing up, uh, was almost as tall as what he guesstimated to be uh, like 10 foot, uh, spruce trees right this thing was behind some willow alders some spruce trees and it was still evident that this thing was hulking behind there immediately the fear from the night before all the the feelings he'd been dealing with all day just came to a head and he just couldn't take it uh he said he broke down he was he was sobbing um he he had to go that direction he knew he had to go that direction. It's now daytime and this thing is obviously ain't scared of the daylight, right? So he, he steals himself and he goes, all right, you know, I'm just gonna act like that thing ain't there and I'm gonna make my way back where I started. So he just, he gets up. He said, I, I felt like a robot. He said, everything I was doing was just one foot in front of the other, keeping an eye up uphill at this thing bear meat on his pack he was like hopefully this thing just is going to go for what I left behind me versus mess with me on what I got with me right that's what he initially started thinking he gets as he's getting closer he keeps getting the feeling that okay okay there's a lot of weight in this pack and I'm not going to be able to maneuver like I want to so he stops still keeping an eye he drops his pack down which isn't light you know, he's got all this extra weight on there packing that meat. So he just starts setting his game bags out. Uh, he unloads everything. Uh, packs everything back in the whole time, keeping an eye on this thing. He's hoping for something to happen to to break this scenario up. A plane fly by, something. Just something to happen where this thing leaves and he knows what direction it left so he can make a solid just go for it, right? After he's unloaded, he gets his backpack back together, slings it on, 
in this thing at once he gets the backpack on and grabs the rifle as soon as he grabs the rifle and checks it this thing started swaying back and forth where it had been standing the whole time just watching him uh, he said he couldn't make out it was too far to make out facial features but he felt those eyes burning a hole through him so he decides Okay, I got I got a whole box of ammo and a half box of ammo. Uh, I'm going to boister myself up and and make a show heading the hell out of here. So he gets a handful of rounds in his one hand, and as he's walking along, he'll pop a shot, start screaming, unchamber around, boom, shoot another one, and then as he would periodically add a couple more rounds, lock one in. Boom. So he's making a big show, a lot of noise, walking not directly at it, but directly out of there, the easiest path he could. As he's doing so, every time he said, every time he was shooting, this thing would kind of do this number, you know, and then start this, this swing faster and faster. Uh, he said it got to a point to where uh, it started making a noise, a whooping noise, and ripped one of the... He said it was about eight, nine foot spruce, roots and all, just directly out of the ground and chucked it. Not at him, just just chucked it. Uh, he said it would would have been chucked off to his right hand side, up into the other trees and stuff. And this thing started making this display, as he called it, uh, loud stomping, um, the whooping sound. He, he was moving around more, staying in the same general area, but more whoop, moving around, just kind of like. Uh, he felt like it was taking what he was doing with the sh shooting the gun as a challenge and he was answering the challenge. So he, he held off on shooting anymore. One, to conserve rounds because this thing was fucking huge. And for two, he, he didn't want to escalate it. He felt like, well, crap, I was trying to be bold and all I did was escalate this thing's reaction to me. So he's, he's trying to think it out. And so instead of going the direction he was going to go, he starts veering away. Little by, not to show any fear even though he's scared shitless he wanted to create distance you know smart guy so he he's trying to think logically he creates more and more distance as he passes where this thing is above him he notices it had calmed down and it was squatted and he said the distance had to have been under 200 yards but he said the way it squatted down it it, it seemed lower than it should be compared to how tall it was he felt it shouldn't be squatted so low to the ground. And then he took into consideration the the perception. He's looking uphill. It could have been on a little bit of a ledge, and then it just looked like it was lower than it actually was, right? So all this stuff's going on with him. Michael gets to a point to where uh, the game trail breaks into two. The one game trail goes further down by the river, but there's a lot more... Uh, willows and alders and stuff a lot more dense foliage i have a harder line of sight and then the upper one was more open and he decided to take that one he gets down there and he's looking this thing is is still up there but at a distance now to where he felt comfortable he wasn't all puckered up you know what i mean uh his expression was you couldn't have pulled a needle out of my ass with a tractor so he, he's calming down a little bit because there's distance and it's daylight. Nothing nothing outside of him escalating into his mind, things that calm down. So he's just keeping it calm. As he's going down this trail, he starts hearing this thump, 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 thump sound, right? So he's thinking, oh, is that that weird helicopter again? He's looking around and then he notices it it's running down the slope behind him into the trees that he's kind of it's broken up it, it's not like one unbroken set of trees but it, it's on a line of trees just offset from the river so it's like shit this thing's coming down behind me and so he decides to pick up his pace uh he starts moving faster and he's he's considering okay what do i do if it comes in on me he's he's pre-planning you know how am i going to place my shots where am i going to shoot this thing what am i going to you know he's just uh, exit strategy he's working it out uh, it's keeping he said he was doing that because it was keeping him from freaking the fuck out uh, He said every part of him wanted to run. I totally totally understand that uh, So he said he got about 200 yards more and there was no noise everything was dead quiet And it, he said it was the most eerie Point in, in the whole thing just because of how quiet it was 
like there was noise when he shot the bear and he was gutting and stuff there, there was noises the bear coming through there was noises and then this happened and everything was dead quiet right so he, he it's catching up to him how quiet it is so he said he got about 200 yards further and he's now out in this lower meadow in the open and he's feeling a lot more comfortable the the sense of dread is kind of fading still there but fading and he said he got about uh, another 100 or so, 75 yards uh, before some more alder willows and stuff were kicked up in front of him along the trail pretty tight. And he, he didn't like that. Uh, he, he didn't want to feel closed in by brush. Uh, he saw how these things move and what it was, you know, how big it was and scary and shit. And he wanted, he didn't want to feel cornered anymore. So he decides he's going to leave the trail and walk along the tundra and the marsh and go around the stand of trees and and he from being there before he knew it wasn't overly far distance to just break trail and go around the shit right he didn't want to feel closed in by the brush so he does so he breaks trail the whole time every every two seconds he said he was looking behind him taking a good hard look at everything behind him and he said once he cleared that area uh, and got back onto the trail where it was more wide open again uh, he said he had to stop, uh, and he he said he sat there. He doesn't know how long. He sat there sobbing and crying, and him being tired, uh, not sleeping, the the trauma, of what was going on, it was all catching up to him at that point. He knew he he had to stop what he was doing, stop the sobbing, snap out of it, and continue moving. Before he couldn't move, right? He felt his body so tired and achy that he he knew he had to get up and go. And I asked him, uh, when, when you were spotting for this thing behind you, did you see any signs of it whatsoever? And he was like, no. There, after, after I saw it coming down the slope behind me, making all that noise and everything was dead quiet, that's the last I saw of it on this particular trail and stuff. So he continues on, and he knows at this one certain junction of a couple trails, he knows he's not all that far from where he was heading to get the hell out of Dodge. As he's moving along, he, you know, uh, it's kind of funny, I've had conversations with people very recently about this real heavy feeling you get after these kind of experiences. Uh, it's like your muscle tension is so high, your, your adrenaline dump is so high that once you come start coming down off of it, it's like just like a thousand pounds on your back, right? So once he started explaining this process he was going through, I knew instantly what he had been dealing with. Uh, he continues on, but he, he recognizes he's getting slower and slower. So he decides, I'm going to not stop, but I'm going to dig a granola bar out start chewing on this granola bar and as he took the first bite of the granola bar he said his stomach got so hungry it had been upset uh and he had been fighting off this hunger pain but once he ate that piece of granola bar he knew he wanted he needed a meal you know what i mean and he knew a meal equaled a nap after and he he just knew he couldn't do it so he put the granola bar away continues on down uh he said he saw caught a glimpse of it one more time at a very great distance just as he was coming down off this knoll about to drop down further down towards where he was going to eventually get picked up uh, he looked back up the valley a ways and he said it was uh, several little meadows away but he saw it moving up towards where he had shot the bear and where he had ended up leaving the game bags and stuff so he felt confident that it, it's distracted, it, it wanted my meat, it didn't necessarily want me. I don't know what the hell's going on with this helicopter shit. So he held on to this uh, for quite a while. He tried to explain to a couple of his hunting buddies, and then they started teasing him like, oh, were you eating mushrooms on the, in the meadow? And just making little jabs, uh, you know. And so he left alone. And anyway, uh, I want to thank Michael for sharing it. Um, the, you know, a lot of these stories, I kind of leave it open-ended when I say he got out of there. The reason being is, is I don't need to go on for a half hour saying, well, he had to sit and wait for a skip to come and all that when it, it's, it's not necessarily relevant to the encounter itself. So I, I, certain things I omit out of it, uh, that aren't necessarily, you know, detrimental to the to overall experience. Um, I want to thank Michael very much 
for reaching out, being patient, uh, being willing to attempt uh, a telephonic interview, even with the, the speech impediment he's dealing with from the stroke. Uh, I sincerely appreciate you, man. And, uh, you know, I'm sure in the comments people w will tell you, you know, it. I, I just try to be a person that anyone could talk to. And I talk to people all over the country. Uh, from other countries and I'm just Fred that you see on camera I'm no I'm no different when you talk to me on a phone so uh, I want to thank him for trusting in me to to give the time to talk and uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining us here and we'll, we'll catch you guys on the next one